Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to start by thanking the organizers of the conference for giving me the opportunity to be here with this very good group of, of students. I, I am very impressed with the work that I have seen uh, so far. So I really congratulate all of the students and the mentors, of course, uh, for the great work that, that you are doing. And today I want to talk so about uh, applications of divisibility of exponential sums to solvability of systems of polynomial equations and to coding and cryptography. And uh, I want to focus today in the applications because this is the last thing that we have been doing with this research. Actually, this is fairly new, so I'm going to, I'm taking my chances here, uh, telling you about things that I'm still working on and that I'm still learning. So, uh, but I think that it's very interesting how the relation about, uh, between the mathem mathematics and the applications go. And this is joint work with some friends, uh, with uh, Francis Castro. Francis is an old friend of mine. We went to uh, graduate school together, uh, first in Puerto Rico in the master, and then he, went, he moved to another place, and I went to Cornell. And also with Luis Medina. And Luis Medina was uh, one of my research students when he was undergraduate student, and now he's a faculty at the University of Puerto Rico at Rio Piedra. So this is work done with friends. And hopefully you will do the same uh, soon when you graduate. So uh, what I was telling you is that, uh, that this research is connected to the applications. It started as a research in math, no? pure math, and maybe some applications to solvability of systems of polynomial equations. And when we were happy with the results that we were getting, Francis comes with the paper and he says, hey, I think that we can apply our results to this uh, area of cryptography. And we start looking at that. And actually, we were very happy to see that we can improve some results. And also, we can answer questions posed in the applications to cryptography. So, and also, we were able to improve our results by getting the insights from the application. So it's a nice uh, way to see how the knowledge is transferred from the applications to the math and back to the applications. So I hope that uh, I can convey this uh, to you today. So the two, two of the applications that I'm going to be talking about, coding theory and cryptography, deal with communications. And communications are information. So it's transfer of information, digital information. So it's, uh, and it's all over. So it's something that affects our daily lives. And we are all the time uh, retrieving information and transmitting information. And this information, uh, the, the information that we are transmitting or storing, we call it the message. And the message can be anything. The information that is stored in a CD, a communications, anything, any information that we want to store or transmit. And the place where we transmit that information or we store that, in, uh, that information is called the channel. It can be the plastic, like the CD, the air, a cable, and it's impossible to make a perfect channel. So it doesn't matter how hard you try, the channels are always imperfect, and we have two problems that, uh, with that. One is that the information that you send might not be the same one that you receive, so because there are errors that occur accidentally in the transmission of that information, and another problem that might happen is that there are people that are not authorized to get that information that can have access to it. And coding and cryptography deal with these problems. So they are, uh, they are areas that are re related, but they deal with the different uh, aspect of the problem. One wants the information to be uh, as it is, and the other one is trying to hide the information. So, and the methods uh, in coding and cryptography are similar, are very similar. So the coding scheme, uh, what you do is that you have a message that you want to store or transmit, and what you do is that you encode that message. You add information about the information, so you add redundancy, so that when you transmit the information through the channel, and there, are, there might be errors that occur during that uh, transmission of information, then uh, the receiver has already information about that information, and the decoder is able 
to locate that error and hopefully correct it if there were not too many errors. So the coding uh, theory, what coding theory does is that it tries to construct good codes. And uh, good codes are codes that can correct many errors without adding too much redundancy. And of course, we also want efficient algorithms for encoding and decoding because we want the communication to be fast. And in this talk, I'm going to be talking about binary linear codes. So I can think on my uh, messages and my, code, and my code words as vectors in, a f in the field with two elements, 0 and 1, no? in the binary field, vectors of length k, this is the message, and when the message is encoded, it's converted into another vector of length n, which is, n is larger than k, and the entries are again zeros and one. And the set of all, the, uh, of all these code words, that's the code. Okay, so the code is a set of all the code words. And in the case of the uh, Christo system, so what we have again is digital communication and we have attackers that are trying to get that uh, information so we encrypt the message and we, uh, the receiver decrypts the message. So it's very similar, the process, and as I said, the methods are also similar. And uh, the goal of cryptography is, con is to construct good crystal systems, and two of the fundamental properties, or the two fundamental properties that were identified by Shannon, who is the father of the information theory, are confusion and diffusion. And there are two properties that are related to, uh, to this uh, confusion and diffusion that are also related to coding. One is the nonlinearity of the function that we are using to encrypt, and nonlinearity is how far you're being from a linear function. Okay, so you want your function to be uh, not to be simple, so you want it far from a linear function, and also that the function is balanced that it will have the same number of ones and zeros, and we will see this later. So the message is then uh, diffused there. There is no uh, statistical bias there. And of course, we also want uh, efficient algorithms for encryption and decryption. So two of the, of the measures or the, or the properties of the codes that are related to our work are the covering radius of the code and also the weight distribution of the code. And for both of them, we need the concept of the Hamming weight. Okay, we can define a Hamming weight on any vector, but now we are uh, working with Boolean vectors, vectors of zeros and one. But in any vector, the Hamming weight of that vector is counting the number of entries that are different from zero. But if our vector is just zeros and one, that's the same as adding the entries of that vector. So that's the Hamming weight, it's something very si simple. And uh, the weight distribution of a code, what it does is that it counts how many code words are of, uh, of weight zero, of weight one, of weight whatever, up to n. So we, we count how many code words we have of the different weights that we, well, that we can have. And the weight distribution of the code is very useful for analyzing and improving the decoding algorithms. The other property, I'm going to illustrate it with a picture and later I'm going to de uh, define this a little bit more carefully. So the other, uh, the other property is the covering radi radius of the code. And what we can think of on that is, so we have our space, well, we have a, a vector space over F2, an and, and dimensional vector space over F2, and the code sits inside that vector space, but does, does, does not cover the complete vector space. So what we do is that we first take any uh, function on, every, on any, every, any vector in our vector space, and we look for the code, the code word, which are these, represented by this, the code word that is closest to it. And then for we take all the functions, all the vectors here, I'm going to identify very soon the vectors and the functions. We take all the, all the vectors and we 
find the largest radius that we have, and that's called the covering radius. So intuitively, what we are doing is that we are making sure that if we take any vector in the space and we take a ball of that radius, there is always a code word within, uh, uh, within that distance or in that ball. And that's very helpful for analyzing the decoding algorithms. Okay? So let me uh, give you some of the math preliminaries that we are going to be using for, for our results. So we are going to be talking or working with Boolean functions. So these are functions that uh, only deal with zeros and ones. So our Boolean function is going to take a vector with, with entries uh, in the binary field, and it's going to send that vector to either zero or one. And any Boolean function can be represented by polynomials, any Boolean function uh, in, in n variables can be represented by a polynomial in n variables where coefficients are equal to 1 and the exponents are equal to 1. And this is a general representation of the polynomial where I'm putting a, an exponent to each one of the variables, but the exponent can be 0 if the variable is not represented in that uh, Boolean polynomial. Okay, so I'm going to be changing about t talking about Boolean functions or binary polynomials. They are all the same here. They are all the same. And some uh, the notation that I'm going to be used sometimes is that I will represent a monomial of n variables by bold x or a vector in n variables by uh, bold uh, big x also, but it should be clear from the context which is which. And we have two nice properties in the when we deal with Boolean uh, functions. One of them, this the one in the bottom is that if you take the monomial x to the, a, x to the d, that's the same as a function at, as x. Because remember that you're evaluating everything in 0 and 1, and 0 to the d is 0, and 1 to the, one, one to the d is 1, so these, are, these two are the same. But also, this exponential is equal to this binomial. Because minus 1 to the x, and x is a, is a monomial, that is, well, when you, mod when you evaluate it, it's going to be either 0 or 1. So it's going to be exactly give you the same value that 1 minus 2x. So you can change that, uh, this exponential to a binomial. And this is going to be nice. So uh, I was talking about balanced Boolean functions. I was talking about balanced Boolean functions. And what we do to, no, to define a balanced Boolean function is that we count the number of zeros and ones in the value set. So we evaluate the Boolean function in all the possible n vectors. And if we have the same number of ones and the same number of zeros in the value set, that we say that that function is balanced. That means that the half of the value set is equal to 1. OK? And finally, this is an exponential sum uh, over the binary field. OK? So we, are t we have a polynomial in n variables and coefficients equal to 1 and 0. And the exponent we can associate with any polynomial here an exponential sum. And the exponential sum is a number. It's an integer. OK, and the exponential sum is just this. Take minus 1 and then evaluate the polynomial in all the vectors in your vector space, in your binary vector space, and take minus 1 to that value, and then take the sum of all of them. And that number is the exponential sum associated to that function. And it's very simple to see that the exponential sum is going to be equal to 0 if and only if the function is balanced. So this is, a first, uh, so this is a connection between exponential sums and the application to coding or cryptography uh, because we can see if a function is balanced by evaluating the exponential sum. But this is not necessarily good news because evaluating the exponential sum is probably as hard or harder than just count the number of zeros and one, or it's the same as counting the zeros and one of the function. And uh, so it's easy to see that the function is going to be balanced because this function is going to be having values of zeros or one, no? And if I have 
this value equal to 1, then I have minus 1. And if this is 0, then this is going to be 1. And if I have the same numbers of 1 and 0, they cancel each other when I add them. So it's very simple to see that. So the property that we study is divisibility of exponential sums. So computing the value, the exact value of the exponential sum in any characteristic is, is hard. It's a very hard problem. But sometimes for the application, you don't need the exact value. You just need maybe information about the exponential sum. And one of the uh, information that is very useful is the divisibility of the exponential sum, the p divisibility. Now we are working over the binary field, so we are studying the two divisibility. And when I talk about divisibility, I'm looking for powers of two that divide the exponential sum. And when I say, when I say exact to divisibility, I want to look for the highest power of two that divides the exponential sum. So it's the evaluation of this exponential sum. So that means that two to the a divides exponential sum, and then two to the a plus one does not divide the exponential sum. And this is good, because if I can find the exact to divisibility of the exponential sum, I'm guaranteeing that the exponential sum is not zero. Because zero is divisible by everything. So if you have the, exponent, uh, the exact divisibility, that means that you have a power that does not divide the exponential sum, it cannot be zero. So that tells you that the function is not balanced. And you may say, well, but you were looking for the balanced ones. Well, but this is good also, because many of the, of the work that is done is by search. So you're searching, you're doing uh, computer searches, and you're d or maybe theoretical, but you're searching for balanced functions. So having a result like this tells you not where not to look for. Okay, so it can help also the computations, and we will see something about this uh, later. So let's go back to the applications again. So the application that we were uh, studying mostly was applications to the solutions of system of polynomial equations. This is the application that we usually work uh, in our research. And it's, this is one of the oldest uh, uh, problems, no? Try to, see if you have a system of polynomial equations, you want to know if the system is solvable or not, or to f even better, find the solutions, count them, etc. So we have a system of polynomial equations. And we have a way to relate an exponential sum to that system of polynomial equations and get the number of solutions of the system of polynomial equations. And this is how we do it. So remember that we define the exponential sum of a polynomial. Now I have a system. So the first thing that I need to do is to get a polynomial out of here. And this is done in this way. We take each one of the equations, see, I mean, each one of the polynomials here, and multiply them by a new variable. So I add y, um, I have here uh, uh, t equations, so I, have, I add t new variables from y1 to yt. And I multiply these, the polynomials, and I add them together. So I'm forming a new polynomial with t extra variables. And I'm, get, I'm, I'm then computing the exponential sum. I just have to evaluate it now in t more variables, okay? In t more zeros and one. And if I multiply the exponential sum by two to the minus t, where t is the number of equations that I have in my system, that's the exact number of solutions of the system of polynomial equations. So this is nice, but it's still hard because computing the exponential sum is hard. But the results that we, ha that we have, if we can compute the exact divisibility, then we have something. We know something, because if we, have, uh, if we can compute the exact divisibility of this system, actually, we need a little bit more because we are adding extra variables. But it's, it's very related. We need an, an extra condition. But with the exact divisibility here, we can get the exact divisibility of the number of solutions, that means that the number of solutions cannot be zero. So that means that the system has to be solvable. No? Because if we have the exact divisibility, we know that 2 to the a plus 1 does not divide n, which is the number of solutions. 
and it cannot be zero. So there is a, that's a way that then the divisibility of exponential sums is related to the solution, so to the solvability of systems of polynomial equations. Now, uh, the other applications are the no applications for us, that are the applications to coding theory and cryptography, and they are both related to Riedmuller codes. Because Riedmuller codes, uh, we can def uh, some of the problems uh, related to Riedmuller codes are also related to cryptography and those, and we will see them uh, very soon. So Riedmuller codes are one of the oldest and better understood uh, codes. But still, they have many, many open problems. Even though they are very old, there are still many things that are unknown. And a good thing for us is that they can be, they are defined in terms of Boolean functions, okay? in terms of Boolean functions. And as I said before, they are used to define properties related to cryptography, and then the two divisibility can also be used to study them. <coughs> so this is the way that we define a Riedmuller code. It's very simple. We take a Boolean function, and we evaluate that Boolean function in all the entries of the vector space. Okay, and we take and we and we make a, a new vector with all the values. So we order the elements of the vector space from zero, 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 the vector zero, 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 and the last one, and we keep going until we have the vector of all ones. And each one of these values is going to be either zero or one. So we have now a vector of length two to the n that has Boolean uh, or binary entries, okay? And if we take this, if we consider all the polynomials with certain bounded degree, that's a Riedmuller code. So for example, the kth order Riedmuller code of length two to the n is defined as the vector that you get, uh, the set of the vectors that you get when you evaluate uh, functions or polynomials, Boolean polynomials of degree less or equal than k. Okay, less or equal than k. So you have many uh, Riedmuller codes and they all have uh, different properties and there are many unknown uh, questions, uh, questions that we don't know the answer. So let's see the relation. Let's, let's, let's start seeing the relation of the exponential sum with the Riedmuller codes. So, uh, one of the, the measures that we said that is very important is the Hamming weight of, the, of a Boolean uh, vector, of a Boolean uh, polynomial now. And we can define the Hamming weight of a Boolean function by just counting the number of, uh, of elements in the vector space that give a value of one when we evaluate the function, okay? So we can relate that to the exponential sum, and we can get an equation, we can get a, a, a formula that relates the Hamming weight of a function with the exponential sum of the function, and it's this one. The relation is this one. Because again, we, we know that this uh, term is going to be equal to one if f of x is zero, and it's going to be, uh, when we evaluate f of x, we get zero, and it's going to be equal to minus one if when we evaluate f of x, we get one. So we get one, uh, minus one, the same number of times that we have the, uh, the Hamming weight of the, of, the, of the polynomial, and the other entries are going to be then equal to positive one, okay? So when, up, when we add them, uh, that's the exponential sum, and we can just, uh, uh, solve for the Hamming weight, and we can just relate the Hamming weight to the exponential sum of the function. So if we get results in one, we are getting results in the other. So in this way, we are, any result that we can get about the exponential sum of a Boolean function tells us something about the Hamming weight of that Boolean function and gives you, give us information of useful for coding or for cryptography. And before I mention, uh, the covering radius of the code. And now the covering radius becomes also important in cryptography. We will see that now. Uh, 
First, we need to define the Hamming distance. The Hamming distance and the Hamming weight uh, is, are very similar. The Hamming distance from two, uh, two uh, Boolean functions is just uh, taking the vectors that they form and counting the number of places where the entries differ. And that's the same as adding those vectors and computing the Hamming weight of, the, of that uh, sum. So the Hamming distance of a Boolean function to a code, and it, I'm talking now about read Muller codes, okay? So the Hamming distance of a function and uh, a read Muller code, what I do is that I compute the Hamming distance of that function to all the functions in the read Muller code, and I take the minimal distance. Similar to what we did before uh, in, the, in, the, in the picture that I showed before. So now, let's take just one function, and let's suppose that these are all the uh, code words. So I take the smallest distance from that function to the code, and I do the same for all the functions in my, in, uh, in, in or all the vectors in my space, and then I take the maximum. So that's what I did before, but now uh, here is the, uh, the expression. So the covering radius of the code is what you do is that you take the minimum distance of a function to the code, and then you consider and, and take then the maximum, the maximum of all the distances when you consider all the vectors in your vector space or all the functions, all the Boolean functions in n variables. Okay, and this is very important, as I said before, for analyzing decoding algorithms. And, the, and it's amazing that even for read Muller codes of order one, which are just linear uh, binary polynomials, the, re the covering radius is unknown if the number of variables is greater or equal than nine and odd. And this is a very old problem that is still open and is related also to cryptography, as we will see now. Okay, so uh, this is a 30 years old problem. And also information about the cosets, when we consider quotients of the codes, is, is useful for decoding algorithm. And, it's, and information on balance functions in these quotients is useful for cryptography. So let's see how is this related to cryptography now. So at some point I mentioned that one of the properties that are important in functions that we use for cryptography is the nonlinearity of that function. So we want the function to have uh, not, not to be easy, not to be, and, and the, easiest, uh, the easiest polynomial that one can have is a linear polynomial. So we, have, we want our polynomial to be as far away from a linear polynomial as we can, and this is a way to measure this. So the nonlinearity of a Boolean function, what it is, is the distance from that function to the read Muller code of order one. Read Muller codes of order one are all are, are formed with all the functions that uh, with the polynomials that have degree less or equal than one. So if we consider all those polynomials as the Read Muller code and the uh, the distance of the function to the code, that's the nonlinearity of that function. That means and how far you are from being linear because the the code contains all the linear functions. Okay, all the linear polynomials on, in n variables. So uh, we want this nonlinearity to be as high as possible to have good fun functions for uh, crypto systems. So this is important, and actually this is bounded by the covering radius because the covering radius was the largest one of all these distances. Okay, so any, any function that you take has to be, the, the, non, the nonlinearity of that function has to be less or equal than the covering radius. So then that's, that's how they are related. The, the uh, computation that we do for coding can be useful also for cryptography. And another thing is that the maximum nonlinearity of balance functions is unknown for n greater or equal to 8. Okay, uh, balance non balance functions 
So let's see, the maximum nonlinearity is attained by some functions that are called bent functions, and they are not balanced. So we want to know which are the closest one to that maximum, to, to, to be the, have the maximum nonlinearity. And we don't know that for n greater or equal to 8. Okay, and remember that the balance, so we, these are the two properties that we want in a crypto system large nonlinearity and balance of the function. So, in summary, uh, if we get improvements in the p-divisibility, in the two-divisibility of exponential sums, then uh, certain functions, of particular functions, we are getting information about covering radius, nonlinearity of, uh, of the functions, so have applications to both coding and cryptography. And if we are able to get exact divisibility, exact to divisibility, then we know that th we can have a solvable system. And also that we have non-balanced functions, so they are not good for cryptography, we have to look somewhere, somewhere else. And about the application to solvability of system of equations, one of the things that we do in any characteristic is to try to uh, see what are the, how can we can characterize families of polynomials that have exact divisibility. So we are constructing uh, families of, of system of polynomials that are solvable. Okay, if we can do, if we can compute the exact divisibility. So as I said, studying exponential sums is not easy. And one of the things that at least I like the most is try to uh, see things that are hard to see if we can find an elementary method to do that. And uh, there is a method that we call the covering method that was introduced by Oscar Moreno and Carlos Moreno some years ago. That is an easy way to study the two divisibility of exponential sums and we extended that method uh, to compute the exact divisibility and also to other characteristics. So this is what uh, the work that we have been doing in the last years. Uh, so let's define what the covering is. So now the covering is, is not the covering as the covering radius. No, I'm, and now I'm, forget about the applications for a second. So when I, when I talk about the covering of a polynomial, a polynomial is just a sum of monomials, no? So I'm going to assume that my polynomials have all the variables. If I'm working in a polynomial ring with four variables, then my polynomial has uh, all the variables at in, 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 one, in some of the terms. So a covering of the polynomial is going to be a set of the monomials that covers all the variables, okay? And the size of the covering is, uh, is going to be how many monomials I have in that set. Let's see, let's see an example that might be easier. So consider this polynomial over uh, F2 and has in, in four variables. If I want to construct a covering for this polynomial, I need to choose monomials such that I have all the variables contained. In. So if I choose this one, I have x1, x2, and x3, I only need x4. So I can choose either this monomial or this monomial. And here I have then two coverings. And actually I can add the, any other monomial. As soon as I have a covering, I, kept, I can keep adding more monomials and I will still have a covering. But I'm looking for minimal coverings, which are the coverings that you can construct with the smallest set of monomial. And in this example, I will always need this monomial because no other monomial has X3. But, and, then, and these are the only two minimal coverings that I can construct. So the theorem uh, that Carlos Moreno and Oscar Moreno prove gives a bound on the two divisibility of the exponential sum, and that bound is given by the size of a minimal covering. Doesn't matter how many minimal coverings uh, there are, so if you have the size of a minimal covering, you know that two to that size will divide the exponential sum. So this is good, it's a bound on the two-bit divisibility, has relation to, uh, to divisibility of the number of solutions of system of polynomial equations, but this doesn't give you exact two divisibility. So solvability of systems cannot be gotten from this uh, result. And so we were wondering why 
<coughs> why you only get a bound and not exact to divisibility? Well, we have to look then a little bit into the exponential sum. So the exponential sum is this, as I defined before. And if we use the property that minus 1 to the x is 1 minus 2x, and of course we have here a sum of terms, so I will have a product of minus 1 to uh, raised to the monomials that I have in my polynomial, and I convert, I can, I can transform that uh, each one of those uh, factors into a binomial, where these are the monomials in my original polynomial, okay? And if I expand this, I will get, uh, I, I expand this product, I will get one. And when I evaluate one in all the, uh, in, in all the vector space, I will get a term that is two to the n, okay? And the other terms will have this form. We have, it will be minus two raised to a power and that power tells you how many monomials you're uh, considering, you're, you're, you have in that term in your multiplication. And here, you have then a product of the monomials, so of some of the monomials in the polynomials. And to get the exact two divisibility of this, uh, or, or that uh, two, two divisibility of this sum, you need to factor. You need to factor the power of two, and you have two to the end here, so you need to know which are the other powers of two that you have here. The n sub lambda is the number of monomials that you're considering here, and actually we know the exact value of this sum. This is going to be exactly two to the L, where L is the number of variables that are missing in the monomials that you're multiplying. Remember that some of the exponents can be zero, so there are going to be variables that are not there. And when you multiply two of the monomials so in, that, in that product, you, will have, you could have missing variables. So those missing variables add to the divisibility, to the divisibility of, of the, actually to the value of this, uh, of this home here. So that means that the, the to divisibility of each term is exactly m sub lambda, which means the number of, of terms that you're considering, plus the number of variables that are missing. And so you then can maybe, maybe say, say, well, then I can factor powers of two, but there is something that could happen. And I'm going to illustrate what happens here with an example. So suppose that this is my exponential sum. So I have the two to the n, plus one term, another term, and a sum of terms. And these two terms, they are going to have powers of two, also a, fa a factor of a power of two, and suppose that these two terms both are divisible, that both have exact divisibility two to the two. So t1 is two to the two times a, uh, an odd number, and t2 is two to the two times a, an odd number, okay? And the other terms have divisibility larger than two. So that means that if you look at them as this, like this, the only power of two that you can factor uh, intuitively is only two to the two, but when you add the odd numbers, you have an even number, and you have an extra power of two here that you, you didn't know before, because of course I'm making up this example, but you don't know that in advance. And the problem is that you cannot control these terms. Oh, you could, but it's hard to, they are hard to control. So this is why here, we don't know what's the divisibility. We know a bound, but maybe when we factor a power of two, you have other powers uh, of two when you add the other terms. And that's why you have a bound and not an exact value. So what we did is that we add extra conditions so we can control the terms here and know exactly when you are going to, uh, well, in some cases, uh, some, with some conditions, know when you have exact divisibility, okay? So this is, uh, this is uh, one of the results that we get, that if we have a polynomial over F2, and we have a unique minimal covering. So remember that before, maybe we have two coverings, and when they add up, uh, so it's related to the terms there, then you have the extra powers, but if you have a unique covering, that won't happen. 
Okay, and uh, if each and there are other things that could happen also, but if you also add the condition that you have at least two variables in each monomial of the covering that are not included in the other monomials of the covering, you get exact divisibility. And this is not hard to get. This is not hard to get. So, and if we have exact divisibility, then you know we know that the exponential sum is not zero. So we know that the function is not balanced, and we can obtain solvability if that polynomial was associated to a system of polynomial equations. So, but that's a unique minimal covering. What if you have more than one? Well, if you have more than one, if you remember the illustration, you have to count them and make sure that the number of minimal coverings is odd. So you cannot factor an extra power of two. So if you have a, uh, a set of minimal coverings, and in a way that all the minimal coverings have uh, the property that each uh, monomial in the covering contributes two new variables to the covering, then you can compute exact uh, divisibility if the number of minimal coverings is odd. If not, then you get an improvement in the bound, you get that then that the divisibility is larger than the size of the covering. Okay, so you have that the stack divisibility is the size of the covering, otherwise is greater than the uh, size of the covering. In, in any case, we are improving uh, the result by Moreno and Moreno, as this uh, example illustrates. So if we have this polynomial, over here, over with x with x variables, the minimal coverings are these two. Okay, so it's an even number. We cannot get exact divisibility, but Moreno Moreno says that the divisibility is two to the three, which is the size of the covering. Our result says that is two to the four. So we improve uh, that result. So. Uh, this is where we realized that, that, that what we have been doing had applications. We were working also with deformations of polynomials. There are, we were, uh, uh, we studied many results by Carlis and many results by Carlis, uh, he, he has polynomials and he deforms the polynomials with other polynomials. And what we realized that when we def were deforming these polynomials, if, those, if we impose some restrictions in those polynomials that we are using for the deformation, we might be just looking at cosets of a Riedmuller code, okay? So, but that comes later. But uh, in general, if we deform a, a polynomial f with another polynomial, so we take the, the sum of them. And if we impose uh, certain conditions, no, we can, we can do the, uh, we can obtain this uh, uh, the conditions for this, uh, for this theorem fairly easy. Uh, so if we deform a polynomial with another polynomial and we have that each uh, covering, each minimal covering has again two new variables, two variables that are, uh, each monomial has two variables that are not included in the other monomials and if we have that the minimal coverings of the polynomial and the deform uh, polynomial are the same, then we have that they, the, their exponential sum is congruent modulo two to the size of the covering plus one. Okay, so we can say the relation about the exponential sum of the polynomial and the deformation of the polynomial and modulo, no, mod modulo something and this result improves a result uh, by Canto in a paper that ha what ha deal with the applications to cryptography. But also we can say something else. If the number of minimal coverings is odd, then we have exact divisibility. So then we have the same exact divisibility for the function and also for the deformation. And this is good because this gives us uh, information about the weight of the cosets in Reed-Muller codes and in particular give us information about the non-balanced functions in the coset and with this we were able to answer a question that was posed uh, by Kusik in one paper 
so let's see here the, the, how the application goes. Suppose that you have a Reed Muller code of order k. So remember the Reed Muller code of order k was uh, constructed using all the Boolean polynomials of degree less or equal than k. And if we can, and so, so suppose that we have all the polynomials there and all the coverings for a uh, Boolean polynomial f are the same as all the coverings of the deformation with the polynomials in the code and they all have two new variables, then we are, with that we get that there are no balance functions in that coset non-balanced functions in that concept. So if you're looking for balanced functions, this gives a way to know, to know where not to look uh, for them. And we will see, uh, we will see uh, with, with the next example, uh, get an intuition of what's going on here. So this explains uh, uh, something that was noticed by Kusik and Cheon uh, in, in some tables that they were studying that were obtained by Ho and Kasami, and they con constructed the table with very large computations. And uh, one of the tables is this. So what they were looking was for uh, balance functions in cosets. And what the, they noticed was that, look at this, so we have more than a million of the balance functions for some of the cosets and zero for others. And Francis uh, found this uh, paper and he said, look at this. So, so maybe we can apply our results to this. And when we look closely, it said, it's very easy to say this with the, we're looking at the coverings. And let me tell you what's going on here. So this is a quotient of a Reed-Muller code of order three and a Reed-Muller code of order two. So these are uh, Boolean functions of degree less or equal than two, and these are Boolean functions of degree less or equal than three, both in six variables, okay? And these are the cosset representatives. So the cosset representatives are going to have uh, degree three, and this is the quotient, no? So this is information about the quotient, but what happened? If you try to, co if you're constructing a deformation, and if you look at this uh, polynomial, so take, remember the last theorem, we have f plus g, take this as f. So this polynomial, uh, this as a polynomial, you have six variables, so the only covering there is the two monomials. And if you construct a deformation with any polynomial from a Reed-Muller code uh, uh, of order two, you cannot get other cover, other minimal coverings, minimal coverings, because here these these monomials are this, have this joint support. So if you take uh, you take any of the monomials in this part, you will need at least three uh, at, at least three monomials, and if an any combination will not give you a minimal covering either. So it's very easy to see that the minimal covering of this polynomial is the minimal covering of this polynomial plus any polynomial in, the, in this uh, Reed-Muller code. And what happened is that also there are two new variables, uh, there actually there are three, in each of the, of, the, of the monomials here. So the theorem, our theorem applies. So that means that the exponential sum of this, uh, that of this polynomial and also of the of the, the exponential the quotient the cosets are exactly the same are exactly the same have the, have, have, I'm sorry have exact divisibility and what this says is that they they are not balanced functions so that means that we have zero balance function in this coset and we can do the same here so we can see that the minimal covering of this part is just the first two uh, monomials. And if you add anything with uh, just a monomials of degree two, you cannot construct another uh, minimal covering. So we have also exact divisibility, and then that implies that the exponential sum is zero. Exponential sum is zero. And that means, the I'm sorry, cannot be zero. 
And that means that the functions are not balanced. So we can do that just by looking at this very, very quickly. And this is something that they did computations to get the results. And, and, and they were looking for other things. They were looking for the relation of the number of balanced functions in the different cosets. So, uh, so there are other, so I don't have too much time now, but there are other characterizations that we can do. So we can obtain many other partial results that will give you a way to determine which cosets have, are completely non-balanced functions, a priori, just by looking at them without having to do any computation. And just to give you a taste of how it, it will go for finite fields of characteristic P, uh, because all the theoretical work extends to characteristic P, and we are here working of the, in the base field, not in extensions. Uh, but we then need to define the covering, and the covering uh, is the definition is different, it's a little bit different because in the binary case, the exponents were zero or one and it was, uh, was fairly easy, but when we go to characteristic P, I'm sorry, the definition of the covering is different. So what we are looking for when we have a polynomial that we split in the sum of mo monomials like this, a covering is going to be not a set of the monomials, but a set of powers of the monomials. And now what we want is that when we multiply all the monomials in the covering, and, and here some of the powers can be zero, that's why I'm including all the, all, the, all the monomials here. And what we want is that when we multiply this, each variable the, uh, has, a, has an exponent that is a multiple of p minus 1. We don't see that in the binary case because in the binary case, p minus 1 is 1. Okay, p minus 1 is 1 and we also have the property that x to the d is equal to x. So this was hidden there, but, in the, but, but that then now is a special case of this uh, general case. And the exponential sum is a little bit more complicated. We have to do the same. We have to expand it. We have to see when is that we don't get exact divisibility. And it's a little bit co more complicated. But then we can get uh, its results very similar to the results that uh, we have for the binary case in terms of exact divisibility. Uh, so here is just to give you an example of what the minimal covering will look like. So this is over F7, two variables. So we want then, we want a, a set such that I take powers of the monomials and when I multiply the monomials, I, I get a multiple of six for each variable, okay? And for example, if I take the first monomial, then I, uh, and I just raise it to the six, then I have that, no? And uh, here I can also take this to the power three and this to the power two or take the first one to the, uh, raise it to the two, and the second one just take it like that. And, oh, and the, the size of the covering is defined differently also. It's not just counting the monomial, it's adding the exponents that we are introducing. So this has size six, this has size five, and this has size three, because this is x to the one is this monomial over here. So the size of a minimal covering in this case is three and is unique with that property in this example. Uh, so, so all the other results extend and if you are interested, I can give you references for this. And to conclude, uh, I hope that, uh, that I at least uh, picked your curiosity to look at this uh, a method of the covering because it's an elementary method to, to study exponential sums and it has a lot of potential in applications because it's an intuitive approach to the divisibility of exponential sums. Well, so with this, I'm finished.